<laughs> All right. Looks like there are people shuffling about. As she said, my name is Mark Lewis. Hello, everyone. Hello. Why does it feel like 8 o'clock in the morning still? Because you stayed right. up late. <laughs> right, um, so I'm here to talk to you today about cannabis breeding, biotechnology, uh, terpenes, flavors, and taste. But to do so, I kind of have to tell some stories. Because I don't know if are there many plant breeders in the room. Go on higher. We're all higher. Higher, higher. Sorry, not me. How many people use cannabis in there? <laughs> all right. How many times can I get to raise your hand? Okay, so this isn't going to be like deep into plant breeding and informatics. If we want to get into that, I'll bring uh, Ryan Lee up afterwards and we can, uh, we can explore some of those topics. But this is more just kind of an overview of where the industry is going and um, how innovation is going to be a key segment and, and uh, growth. And, you know, uh, previous to this event, um, we used to go to hemp cons and NCIA and all these different places where the biggest innovation from uh, the standpoint of the, the, the conference goer was a new trimmer or, you know, some extraction system that they hijacked from a process that was already fine-tuned in pharma and applied it to cannabis. So I guess my point is there wasn't a whole lot of innovation going on. Um, fancy LED lights, gross chambers, all stuff that agriculture and the, the one dollar a pound for conventional basil couldn't support, right? You can't, can't spend a 20 million capex on a range of greenhouses if you don't plan to make 20 million dollars in the first few years. And as we're standing on this hill, looking down at the marketplace, you know, we have to think, you know, what's, what is the largest segment in the market for, for cannabis consumption? Anybody know? People that don't smoke. There you go. There you go. You must have heard my talk before. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so that, that, that's, that's kind of the story. And the, and the biggest area for actual innovation in this space was uh, it, it isn't in technology per se, it, it's in a different area. And for us to understand that area, we have to think about the cultural perspective on the market and how it's permeated through almost every sector. Um, and that, that's the cultural perspective. You know, I, I used to play Monopoly in college on Fridays. Before that, I played it at home with my brothers and my family. But when I went to Rose Holman for the first time, where I got an undergrad in chemical engineering, um, the first Friday we played Monopoly, I landed, you know, rolled the dice, land on Indiana Avenue, and I didn't buy it. And they're like, oh, that's going into auction. So I was like, what the fuck is auction? I'm like, I've never heard of this before. I thought it was the next person's turn. And they're like, no, don't you read the directions? You're here to be an engineer, and you don't read the directions? Right. Very well. So those rules were taught to me by my family or by my culture. And it's an example of where somebody had taken something that was more complex and kind of oversimplified it and made it less fun. And that's what, that's what the cannabis industry has done in a lot of ways, and I'm not poking at anyone, but the notion of higher THC is better, the notion of holding your hit longer, you'll get higher. All of these things, those are all cultural impacts. And I'd like to think that that's not the best way to look at things, especially if the non-daily non user is the biggest market segment, because those people aren't, wanna, aren't gonna wanna feel weird. They're not gonna wanna have paranoia. They're not gonna have, where's my keys, where's my phone? You know, like, um, <laughs> that's just, that's just not the culture, and you, and you definitely don't want a mother of two in a soccer game worrying about other mothers judging her for being high at that moment. And if you if you innovate a little bit, you can remove those feelings. You you can make this a lifestyle drug, which is essentially where it's going. I'm not sure that cannabis as a plant can cure anything, but it definitely can be applied as a lifestyle drug, which is a, a huge segment in pharma, whether it's anxiety. Or, or, or 
and again, if it's a, I said this yesterday, but if it's adult use or medical, it doesn't matter. They're both therapeutic. So we have, we have to think about this in the, in the grander scheme and step back. And a lot of people don't even realize that alcohol is like one of the best painkillers on the planet. We, we've used it for years to treat pain, and it's just a, a bottle that you buy at the store. Um, another cultural impact is the indicative notion, which I'll get into sooner or later, but um, uh, based on that perspective, the biggest innovation in cannabis in 20 years has been THC concentration, right? There's been this linear growth. Every year it gets stronger. And whether it's correlated or not correlated, I like to look at the literature. And in 1996, a group did a study looking at cannabis use, and we'll get to the definition of cannabis shortly, and adverse events. And in 1996, about 20% of cannabis users experienced adverse events. Same study was done eight years later, six years later, with a N of 10X that study. 40% of users experience adverse events. So if you fast forward to the future and today, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are going to have an adverse event. And, you know, doing a dab and getting a panic attack, that's an adverse event. Having heart palpitations, that's an adverse event. You're essentially overdosing on a compound. And more and more studies are coming out supporting the notion that high THC and high CBD alone isn't as beneficial as the two together. Right? It's a lot like those old Reese commercials where the cop crashes, Officer Reese's crashes into the thing and like, oh, you got my chocolate and your peanut butter and you have my peanut butter and your chocolate. And then, you know, they're better together is what I'm saying. <laughs> my wife would argue and say that chocolate's better by itself. But <clears throat> the point is, there isn't a lot of uh, diversity in the marketplace and how do we bridge that gap? Technological innovations in this space they don't exist really, and we need to change that. I feel like this could be this could be the conference where it becomes more technology focused. It's not just a new trimmer or an extractor, as I as I mentioned before. That's those are innovations that the other industries brought here. Um, it could be new things. It could be novel plant types. It could be resistance to pests and disease and all of those things that we all are happily working on. So. Cannabis, what is it, right? You go to the doctor, do they write you a prescription for poppy? Yeah, that's a poppy. <laughs> Treat your cough. Oh. It can be codeine for a cough. It can be morphine for pain. It is clean for anti-cancer therapy. Many compounds, one plant. And cannabis, today's medical program is, here's a recommendation for cannabis. What's in it? What are you using it to, you know, what chemicals are acting on your ailment or your symptom? And a lot of times we don't know, <clears throat> or as uh, this generic indica versus sativa thing, you know, uh, trying indica, it's gonna treat your anxiety. But there's this misnomer that cannabis is just a thing. And there's a huge disconnect between anecdotal um, reports of whether it's, oh, it, help me for my pain or you know it made me superman there isn't corroboration on the research side and we want to know why that is right and it could be because the market's homogenous you know there's only high thc there's only thc nida only offers thc on a lot of levels right now so so the research is impacted by the marketplace and the culture because the culture says high thc 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 and that has been the centric focus, whereas all of us know nowadays, CBD seems to be this, this booming market of everybody wanting to buy it off Amazon so they can, you know, find that cure. But having said that, the way that regulators look at this is very THC-centric. You can kind of see some of the um, <clears throat> universal signs or symbols for cannabis. And five out of seven have THC right on the logo. And, you know, Oregon, with their oversupply of 1.3 million pounds, they were very smart. They trademarked their pop symbol, so at least they can make their money back licensing that symbol out to other jurisdictions. But they, uh, they have the, I can't do it from here, it's like reflecting off, that's pretty cool. 
Uh, but it's the one without THC in the top middle. Um, very forward looking. And if you have a product that doesn't have THC in it, but it's a cannabis product, and it has to have the THC logo on it, I mean, that doesn't even match up. The FDA wouldn't like that very much, would they? Um, anyway, this whole definition of cannabis, and we need to be careful with that because indica and sativa is a cultural concept. It's not really a construct rooted in anything other than our, our own culture. <clears throat> and before I get into the, 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 the meat, I just like to remind everyone that in the past, it was closets, backdoor deals, zero regulation. Today, we're somewhere in the middle. In the future, it's going to be regulated. Whether it's FDA, whether it's us, the DCC, whoever, someone needs to regulate it. And that's all about public safety. It isn't to kill the culture, it isn't to stop the movement, but it's to make sure that people aren't putting adulterants in e-pens, which happened recently for some CBD pens that were being spiked with synthetic cannabinoids. Um, it's to guarantee public safety, because at the end of the day, someone is gonna have to pick up the Medicare bill for kids 18 to 25 doing dads their whole life and causing some sort of brain harm by overdosing the THC constantly every day. Not saying that that's gonna happen, but it's certainly a possibility, right? And if all you have to do is co-administer a little CBD to mitigate those harms, why wouldn't you do it? And you still get all of the benefits and all of the happiness and all of the high. You just have a safety net there to protect your brain, which is probably the most valuable organ you have, unless you're a teenage boy. Right? <laughs> so. Or girl. <laughs> get her number. So, <laughs> So, I, and I'd just like to tell a little story about a person who came to us back in 2011, 2010, and she was looking for something to get off of Fexer and fly, uh, fly, uh, Fexer, Zoloft, and Paxil. She bounced around between these anxiety medicines. And uh, essentially, <laughs> she was super stoked when cannabis became legal. And she was like, oh my gosh, here's an alternative to a pharmaceutical. So she goes to the physician, the physician writes her a recommendation, and the recommendation uh, is for cannabis. And she's like, well, what do you think? And she says, well, the, the physician tells her, just don't smoke it. Because, you know, smoking is bad. So she goes to the dispensary and she's like, fucking candies, chocolates, woo! We know where this goes, right? <laughs> yeah, Frankenstein, she's got it. Just, you know, and there was no, no CBD pens back there as a rescue, right? She, she was painting on the walls with mustard and calling me and saying, this is crazy. And, uh, you know, we, we couldn't tell her to do anything but just chill out and take a nap. Uh, so she goes back to the dispensary because, you know, the, you know, we're all like, well, try flowers, you know? And the, 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 the edibles weren't labeled all that well. They're still not labeled all that well. I mean, weight percent doesn't really tell you anything right. about them. You need to have a, a dosage amount. So every cultivar there could possibly imagine, every meaning you could possibly imagine on the board, and uh, she, 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 she's like, what's, well, what's good for anxiety? And but and it's like, well, all of them. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, uh, you know, and the says, try an, try an indica, you know? And she's like, what's an indica? Like, oh, it has fat leaves and it grows short and it's sedative. Okay, that's cool. So she tries an indica and it's the same thing. Um, just basically anxiety, anxiousness. Back then, the dominant terpenes in the marketplace, and I'm going kind of fast here to get to the part where it's cool and innovative. But back then, in 2011, three quarters of the market was myrcene dominant um, on the type one side in California. Um, a lot of innovations happened between now, uh, then and now. A lot more chemical diversity. SC Labs can uh, attest to this the best since they see the most number of tests. But it was pretty homogenous then, and um, today, if you look at the Nature article from January, about 98% of the products grown in Washington State were high THC. That's 98% THC. We're, how are, there's so many different people types, right? I mean, there's, there's 170 different salad dressings, but there's only THC, right? Like, how do you, 
how do you hit all of those different per people types, right? And, and in flavor and fragrance, different panels are decided by how they taste, not by some blind study where you look at everyone. Some people have mutations in their taste buds that don't allow them to taste certain flavors. And that's a huge segment of the population. So when you're making products for the masses, you have to look at all these different market segments and create flavors and effects and things that are targeted and not just, oh, we're going to bang this out, high THC, make money, because that's going to, this race to the bottom is going to come to an end at some point. But if you look at the uh, toolbox for NIDA and the Canada's marketplace, it's pretty limited. Um, you have THC with different dominant terpenes, and for CBD, there's only pretty much one dominant terpene, and that's myrcene. There are some exceptions out in the marketplace. Uh, for the most part, it's a homogenous um, product offering. So Samantha was pissed. She didn't like it. She gave up on cannabis. <clears throat> she said we were kooks. And uh, that was all good until this pretty guy got on the TV and started talking about weed. Uh -huh. Then she had this new hope, you know. Even my dad called. He's like, oh, dude, you've been selling weed your whole life. It's cool now. Sanjay said so. Whoa, Dad. That's what it took, man. It's yes. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> right? How many people got calls from their parents saying it's cool? See? I am not. We should start a support group. Yeah. <laughs> right there. Sanjay saved our Sanjay. family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then immediately after this, right, everybody was like, CBD, everything. Yeah, I don't know about that, but you know, was, this is what people said, right? So obviously Samantha was stoked. She was like, fucking CBD. And uh, she went to the clinic, and back then there was only Harlequin. You yeah. guys familiar with that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah like Buzz Killer, not Buzz Giver, right? Um, when you mix myrcene and CBD, it's just like a deadly combination for kill your buzz and make you depressed, I think. Um, but that was her experience too. She didn't like being in a cloud all day. She actually preferred the uh, pharmaceutical solution for her problem. Um, which is sad because, you know, anytime you can't help someone, you always feel like you left something on the table and you need to, need to go back to the drawing boards. But during this time, um, some clients of ours were working towards something, but for me to explain that something, I have to actually explain a way to visualize that something. You know, I saw a hat today that said chemicals kill cannabis heals oh. and I was like well isn't it chemicals full of chemicals? Yeah, yeah. THC. Well, like a machine gun blast of chemicals too. Yeah, so. But to, 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 to be able to see all these chemicals, whether it's the 17 terpenes or you know 13 cannabinoids that this Phytofax report outlines, we, we had to do something because when you got a test report from a laboratory that was essentially a bunch of lines in black and white with numbers and letters like LOQ and you know whatever dispensary people they didn't really get anything glean anything from it and the market then would say hey what's the strongest what's the highest THC let me buy that and uh, a really insightful dispensary owner um, Andre Speciale she she asked specifically for a way to visualize the test results that could be easy and intuitive, and we, we worked on this for her, and we color-coded the terpenes intuitively so that, you know, lime means yellow, pine means green, um, and, 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 and basically the warm tones on the terpene profile, they, they instigate a, a sativa-like terpene high, right? So, if you just vaporize terpenes, whether it's limonene, terpenoline, or whatever, you can totally feel the effect of them if you, you have a concentration high enough. Typically in high THC cannabis, the THC pharmacology overwhelms the terpene pharmacology, so you get kind of this just a high. But as you start adding CBD to the mix, the terpene entourage um, kind of kind of gets shuffled out and rises to the top. This particular example is classic perps. Uh, like I said, I think the laser reflects off the, the thing there, so it's pointless. But the uh, we have flavor and aroma there that's calculated from the terpene profile. The purple bar is myrcene. You have blue, bit caraffeine, and then the green is pinene. This is indicative of any perp. So. 
Terps is a category that we define by chemistry. It ends the name game. So if you have Kins GDP, or Purple Purple, or Classic Perps, or even a Blue Dream, they fall in this kind of uh, cassette of terpenes that you know people are familiar with. Now, having said that, we can continue our journey with Samantha, where you're looking at this is OG legend. It's a pretty pretty indicative OG. It's a hybrid of OG, classic OG, and classic Bubba Kush. Limonene dominant, really great OG nose that pops in your face, explodes. Um, and this is a type one. If you look at the black circle, it looks like a donut. Black is THC, gray is the CBGA. You see it's mostly THC, and it gives her Frankenstein and sad things, right? Well, if you're in a greenhouse, and you're <laughs> going over, and you're smoking type one, you're gonna get that adverse event, right? So, I was working for me just as much as I was working for Samantha here. Um, Ryan Lee is probably sick of giving me hugs. Remember that, Ryan? Uh, yeah, that volcano, man. <laughs> and they showed that, you know, the delivery of THC to lungs is higher in a volcano than uh, smoke just recently, so that explains a lot. Um, but when you add a little CBD, which this is a, a breeding technique, right? Uh, most of the cannabis that breeds type 2 in the industry has a ratio of THC to CBD of 1 to 2. Um, there are reasons for this, and it's hard to uncouple that um, correlation. But here we have greater than one THC to CBD, which that allows the THC to overwhelm the CBD contribution. I don't know if you're familiar, but if you, this is my hand gesture of, um, what do you call it, blood serum levels. So THC, you smoke it, it's up and you're down fast. You, as you add CBD, it mellows the rise and prolongs the effect. So if, you, if, you're, if you're consuming a type 2 cannabis that has a lot, you know, two parts THC to one part CBD, your high will actually last longer than THC alone because of the pharmacology of the CBD in the body. Um, but this was still a little too edgy for, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you this taste is indistinguishable from the type 1, but it's a type 2, which that's novel in the marketplace. To smell something and go, damn, that's a fire-ass OG, and then for someone to go, oh, it's only 14% THC and 8% CBD, they're like, oh, it's only 14%. But then you, you consume it, and it's a really enjoyable experience. You still really, you, you get all of the relief, and it's, it's, it's like getting safely stoned, you know? Um, but this wasn't good enough for her. This is actually my favorite um, world. But when we added more CBD, essentially, became perfect for Samantha. And the trick with this, we tie in the breeding, is keeping the flavor constant across all these different cannabinoid profiles. But more importantly, how do you develop a parental set of lines that can breed true so that out of a thousand seeds, they all have this chemical profile that is predictive of not only the terpene concentration, the flavor and aroma, but also predictive of the cannabinoid ratio and concentrations. And that's a little bit more tricky, right? <clears throat> and with any plant or human uh, or dog or whatever breeding, you must isolate one trait at a time. It's, must, uh, it's very similar to conducting an experiment. If you're growing in your grow room and you change the humidity, the temperature, and your nutrients, how do you know what affected the plant and change your outcome? So the same goes for, for, for breeding. And, um, Ryan uh, Lee, actually, I'd like to bring him up after my talk because he's probably the most knowledgeable as it pertains to, to cannabis and cannabis breeding probably in the world. And he can describe all of the ins and outs of whether it's a singular or singular nuclear trait and you know, uh, the informatics behind that. What we're good at is supplying the infrastructure to create these novel products. And, um, the, the, the crux of it is, how do we go from where we are today in this industry of all, all, like there's a lot of noise out there and there's no talk of innovation. Is there? I mean, um, uh, there's a lot of music, a lot of weed smoking, a lot of drinking, but 
not a lot of people talking about where are we going to go next year? How are we how are we going to protect our margins moving forward? What you know, everyone's just it's like a no. gravy train right now, right? Like cheesecakes and pork chops everywhere. <laughs> so to isolate a trait, to create parental lines, it takes time. Um, one of our pet projects are color traits, obviously. And what's nice is if you take a really, really great parental, it's purple, all purple, and you hybridize it with an all green, and then you, you germinate that, that class, you get like this nice mix. But then when you F2 that class, the purple trait bounces between every part of the plant. And if you have 100 plants lined up in a row and you're walking down, you can see the purple trait on the top side of the leaf only, on the bottom side of the leaf only, on the pistils only, they turn pink. Or the flowers are purple and the leaves are green, or the leaves are purple and the flowers are green. And it's really neat the way the trait bounces all around, right? Well, if you want that trait to come back, you have to pick the plants where you want the trait to be. Then you have to sell them and lock that trait in one piece at a time, right? Many people use males and females to breed, and it's difficult to get segregation that way. Ryan, you can talk about this later. But it's almost counterintuitive. I, I, I'm not sure any plant breeding projects in the world that still go about it that way. Instead, they use ethylene blockers to create segregation so you have clear populations so you can isolate those traits. And um, in the future, obviously, we'll do haploid lines and things like that and create reducers, which then you can pass all those traits over really nice and smoothly. But I just want to show you some of the innovations that have happened in the past few years so you can kind of see what, it, what the trajectory of technology in the plant space looks like. Um, as shown, these are three OGs with differing cannabinoid, cannabinoid concentrations. Um, same nose, virtually indistinguishable between each other. So to be able to conduct patient panels or research with these is very, very um, awesome because it's almost like having that, that, that cannabinoidless control that GW recently patented. But another uh, series of plants from and that this article, this article was written with Dr. Ethan Russo and Kevin Smith um, called Pharmacological Foundations of Cannabis Chemovars, was published this year. Um, here are three lines with the same terpene profile, same flavor, same aroma, uh, same bud structure. Uh, the one on your far left is one-to-one -one THCV and THC. The one in the middle is approximately one-to-one -one THC and CBD. And the one on the right is one-to-one -one CBD, CBD, VA. So this is where we're introducing the propyls in. We have constant uh, chemical, uh, the flavor and aroma. So when people try these different things, they get pronounced different experiences uh, that's highly driven by the cannabinoid pharmacology. And this is where you start looking at these different market segments. Well, we got the people who want to get really stoned. Those are the OG people. Well, what about the soccer moms? What do they like? The CBD, CBDV line, um, guava jam is essentially this, this cultivar. It's uh, it won the World Cup CBD contest last year, and it gives you uh, an experience somewhere between nicotine and caffeine without the jitters. It's completely different than THC, but it's a pronounced effect, pronounced mood enhancement. And these subtle effects and en enhancements are exactly what the masses are looking for. And this is the type of technology to make it tasty and flavorful and to get into products that people can try and will open their minds on cannabis even more than they already are. Um, some other innovations here. This is uh, showing how you breed THC out of a line using propyl CBD. Um, on the left is a one-to-one -one CBDV to CBD. As you move across, you see the gold in the donut getting larger and larger. And that means that CBDV, we're breeding out the THC and replacing with CBDV. The, the plant in the far right has less than 0.1% THCA. So it's obviously hemp, but it's still producing 10 to 12% cannabinoids. And um, a lot of them are, are chirped out depending on which, which plants you're looking at. Um, again, those plants would have this THC moniker and that universal symbol, which makes people think that 
there's THC in it, but like less than 0.1% is not much THC at all. Uh, pinene, here's a series also in the Pharmacological Foundations paper. On the left is mostly THC, on the right is mostly CBD, and the middle's a one-to-one. -one. These plants are chirped out. Uh, there's plants in this family, one of the parentals produces 4.5% pinene alone, which is crazy. Um, pinene's pretty harsh though. Uh, you know, when you start when you start producing flowers for consumption, you you, you can I can smell harshness. Like, it's a joke between everybody. I'm like, oh man, that's hard. I'm gonna smoke that. How many people can smell CBD? Really? You know, it's over this, right? Um, that's like I, I I remember walking in my friend's basement. And I'm like, man, it smells like radon in here, man. That's a Midwest joke. But again, radon's odorless, but um, funny to mess with people. Uh, yeah, so, so this pinene cultivar, though, it's very interesting. If you put enough myrcene or caraphylene or limonene in it, it smooths out the, the pinene a lot, so it's more uh, palatable. But endurance runners, like, there's a group of about 10 ultra runners in uh, where I'm from that just love pinene one-to-one. -one. It, it gives them enough of a, a pain reduction that they can do their 50 or 100 mile run, and, which is insane. But also, they, they claim that the pining makes them aware of the trail and not excited to jump off the cliff, which is it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, and if you don't know already, cannabis is considered a performance enhancing drug for ultra runners and long distance athletes. So it's banned because of that reason, right? <laughs> because it helps you turn your mind off. And you know, your mind controls everything. So, and, and, and that's a, a factor here too. Uh, here's um, some really tasty CBG lines. On the left, you have about 7% CBG and 20% uh, THC. These all smell like delicious pineapple. And I believe the one on the left is actually uh, a cultivar called the Happy Pineapple that Molecular Farms uh, produces. <clears throat> and then as you see the light gray in the donut getting larger and larger, you can see again breeding out the THC and replacing it with CBG and keeping the flavor, which is osamine, pinene, and beta caryophylline pretty consistent, so they all smell, have this nice sweet, osamine, pinene flavor, but they have very different cannabinoid concentrations, which results in very different effects. And um, I can tell you that the CBG also does what CBD uh, kind of does, where it mitigates a lot of the adverse events of THC. It, it cools it down a little bit, so you don't get that, you know, panic attack or worrying about something you said your mom 10 years ago. <laughs> uh, and then CBG and CBD, which we've done pretty much the same thing with, and you can see here I'm getting ushered out of here. So again, uh, huh? Oh, I was at 20 minutes. Okay, cool. Perfect. We've got tons of time for questions. So the whole premise of this conversation was to educate and get you caught up on innovations happening chemically in the cannabis plant world, and then open the floor to questions and bring my good friend Ryan Lee up here to help me answer them since he's way smarter than me at that stuff. And, uh, but that's what you do, you leverage people who are smarter than you to get the job done, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, I'd just like to remind everyone that in the past we had no regulations. In the, in the future, it's going to be heavily regulated, period. We're somewhere in the middle in what Nacro, uh, we're a technology company, right? So we want to bridge the gap between the two. And, and you know, it's important because Technology is not just about science and data and numbers. It's about people and stories. And, and our whole goal has always been to find a problem and then create the solution. And those solutions have to help people. They just can't be something that you're like, oh my gosh, I got an idea. And let's, 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 let's turn it into a product and sell it. And it's like, that's not how successful products are created. S successful products are created by saying, Look at all the people that don't like that. How do we make that? How, how do we create something that they'll actually like? And how, how do we create something that tastes better? How do we create something that's molded, mold and mildew resistant? And, and all those great things, which this plant is so plastic and dynamic. You know, it, it's, 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 it's like corn and humans and dogs. It's, it's like you can just push it one way or the other and 
You know, before you know it, you have a Chihuahua plant, you have a St. Bernard plant. They're crazy different, but they all came from the same plant. And then creating those genetics to be stable in multiple environments. And if it's an asexually propagated clone, I'm kind of going off on a tangent. Uh, it can vary a lot from whether it's outdoor, greenhouse, indoor, um, the, the chemotype of that genotype will change depending on the environment because of epigenetics. Now, a lot of the seeds that um, we produce that are homozygous chemically and morphologically, they actually can endure different environments and have more stability across those environments. So. The future is going to be, uh, you know, homozygous seed production. Today we're stuck in this asexual clonal pro production world, and uh, I just love to see where it goes. And um, I hope you en enjoyed the talk. But this day, this plant can treat everything, right? Everybody agree? Woo! Woo! Uh, yeah. Paul Parker, the ACA, or ICRS, Dr. Ethan Russo, everybody says there's applications for this plant everywhere. Might remind you that the largest pharmaceutical cannabis company in the world is GW Pharma, and they still get all of their cannabinoids from plants. So innovations in the plant space will directly impact pharma, and vice versa, I'm sure. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to answer them. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And here's a mic. And please don't touch it. Thank you. I'm going to walk around. Oh, oh I'm Mike. Woo! I'm hot. <laughs> the mic only works up here. I stay on stage. Hello? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay, come on. What's up? Ask questions. Hello. Um, I have a quick question on uh, the analytical testing, specifically around the volatile terpenes mostly. Okay. Um, looking at testing of those terpenes, um, from the perspective of the, the plant itself and the breeding perspective and then the consumer product, um, you would think that there would be some change in the makeup of those volatile terpenes through the cured dry process. Do you have any comments around appropriate time to uh, uh, perform that testing from both uh, plant breeding and then also you know, the finished product perspective? Or is it a wet type sample that should be submitted or for... for, for um, you know, the breeding information and the, the, the finished group product for you know, the consumer information or any thoughts on that? Well, obviously, you, know, you wouldn't want to test the wet product if you're not selling wet product, right? However, if it were a commodity and you were pushing that wet product as a fresh frozen thing, then perhaps it makes more sense to do the wet testing. Uh, typically, to get a Phytofax report, it's pre-packaging, like literally moments before packaging, so that they can guarantee the shelf life of that 60 days to be true to the Phytofax. If you don't do the proper packaging with seals, then naturally the, the degradation occurs faster. If it's not stored properly, it occurs faster. If, and, and yes, the terpene profile changes during the curing process. If you were looking to protect um, you know, some makeup of the, um, those terpenes, um, you know, as an you know, IP that you would generate. Um, and would, could that be on the product itself, the plant, you know, plant, I guess plant IP um, and patents on the plant, should it be actually tested on the plant before it's cured and dried? Or is there, um, you know, any thoughts around that uh, compared to the finished product? Is, is there enough variability to see changes? You know, I'm not a plant attorney, so I would, you guess it's good mine. Right. Thank Sorry. you very much. Yeah. Hey, Beth. Hi, Mark. Right. Um, You're next on The Price is Right. I'm next on The Price is Right, Mark Lewis. Okay, check this out. You're going to bid on this chair right here. Oh, my God. Uh, $10. No, damn it. 20 So maybe 21 So um, I also want to ask you about your patents, but uh, we'll talk about that later. I have a question about the um, homozygous nature of these seeds, and um, so uh, there's an artist, Natalie Jeremijenko, who did, are you familiar with her? No, I didn't know what you said. Uh, Natalie Jeremijenko. Okay, yeah. She is an artist um, who did an experiment some years ago called Many Trees, and she took clones of trees and planted them in a variety of different locations to basically show how environment impacts, um, it impacts how things grow. Can you explain a little bit of the science behind how 
um, stable seed lines can actually produce more stability in different environments? Uh, Brian, I think that's a question for you, isn't it? <laughs> well, just do the Kelly and Conway. Answer any question you want, and at the end, say that I answer your question. So you were asking, how was I going to say? No, how are, why are seeds more robust chemically than plums? Well, and basically, like, how is it that, like, because of the variability that can happen in different environments, how is it possible to have stable seeds that produce more stable results in different environments? Well, you can't. So when we're breeding, we can only control the genetics of the plant, right? Um, and, and epigenetics, or what we're referring to as this environmental effect that happens across environments, is something that you're going to have. It doesn't matter what the genetics of the plant are. So, um, but you know, creating homozygous seed really allows us to have that uniformity so that we can start exploring these things. So I don't know if that's the And thing. asexual propagation in itself is stressful on the plant, and our study showed that the more stress you put on that plant, the more it has a tendency, you know, people say, oh, it lost its vigor, or it's a genetic drift, or whatever. Those, a lot of times, those asexually propagated clones that become stressed out, whether they're mothers and they're root-bound, you know, that, that's just not the, you know, the most, not the best way to do that for that plant, because you want all those switches turned on. And if your plant is stressed out because it's been asexually propagated and beaten up and, and locked out, whatever, it has a tendency to be more myrcene dominant. The cannabinoid and the oil concentration goes down. And the only way that we've seen to fix that is to plant those, those plants in the ground during the lengthening season. So in the spring, under the sun, you get your, your circadian rhythm back. You have your unlimited root growth and that can snap a lot of the switches out. Other ways are to strip it down to tissue culture and get that nice vigorous growth back to the vegetative stage. But as for the seeds versus clones thing, it, it's just, it's so notable the difference between how a seed performs and a clone performs from the vigor side, from the resistance to pests, pathogens, it's, it's quite notable. Yeah, and we're seeing through the tissue culture some of these companies in Canada do it now, the testing that, uh, you know, we, we realize that these plants they acquire, it's like post traumatic stress disorder for humans, right? Like these plants acquire, uh, like Mark's calling them stress deaths, but it's often it's bacteria or viruses or whatever. And uh, they grow and they live with the plant. And uh, that's one of the things the tissue culture is able to do is bring it back down to the meristem and eliminate all those uh, external for forces on the seed. When you grow it back, you have a fresh plant, which is really close to what we have with seed. It's one of the benefits that we have when we grow with seed. Um, the trade-off is that the current environment, a lot of these seeds are hybrid seeds, and they're kind of all over the place. Uh, phenotypically and chemotypically, we don't have that uniformity. Um, so well, that's, that's a selling point, right? You can buy 10 seeds and get 10 phenos. Well, that was someone who was saying yesterday to me, you know, it's, it's a really important thing to have this pheno hunting. And, and, you know, typically in, in regular agriculture, that's something that's relegated to the plant breeders. It, it's not, you know, an everyday gardener thing. They go and they look for plants. Usually in horticulture, producers produce and that's all they do. They don't go and look for the variation. So it's something that our community is all adopting, which is great because we have this distributed platform where a lot of different people are looking for a lot of different flavors and effects. So it's, you know, you don't have one person's perspective on it. Yep, so as a proper introduction to Ryan Lee, he, uh, he founded Chimera Seeds many years ago. He works directly with Border Farm BB through his company, King Bar. And, uh, he, he does a lot of the importation into Canada for seeds and whatnot, right? Yeah, so. we do, we do uh, again, through our, our partnership with Border Farm uh, in Canada, it's a really regulated system where you can't just bring genetics into the system. Licensed growers, they have to document where all their seeds come from. So we, uh, we facilitate genetics into these, into these companies. Yeah. Any other questions? I have a question. Yeah. What do y'all feel about feminized seeds? Everybody wants to go straight feminized. I'm not sure what, how I feel about it. What do you guys think? Yeah, so the proper term for feminized seeds is actually gynocious seeds. Uh, when we talk about dioecious, monoecious, you've probably heard these words. Um, it comes from the Greek word for two houses. So there's, right, when we have a dioecious plant, there's, you know, a male house and a female house of the same species. So gynecious just means that 
the breeding is done through two female plants. So we use a chemical manipulation to induce pollen on those plants, and then we can breed. Um, you know, we can use that pollen for for making crosses. Um, and originally, the the seeds that came on the market from Dutch Passion and some of these other early companies, the methods that they used to generate that seed um, had all these inherent problems with intersexuality. Um, so people were growing plants and having, you know, f female plants would be formed of seeds, and obviously as a cannabis cultivator for flowers, that's not ideal. Yeah. Um, so I think that really tainted the reputation of what we call feminized seeds on the market. Uh, and people, you know, really wanted to stay with these regular male-female crosses. But the problem is, is actually using males is a, is a pretty terrible way to select pollen donors for cannabis because the plants themselves don't express the traits of interest, right? I use this kind of crash anal crass analogy. It's like, if you're breeding humans for breast size, it's pretty easy to choose the females, right? But how do you choose the males? How do you choose the males that have that trait for large breasts when they don't express that trait, right? So when we're using, when we're doing female crosses and uh, some of the work we did at Napro, um, we really see that there's this huge gain that you can get when you're doing positive selection for chemistry on both parentals. It just it speeds up your breeding. And uh, it's also a beautiful thing when you're screening these plants. You don't have to go through and eliminate the males. You're not spending resources and time. And you know, now a lot, of, a lot of these companies are offering these genetic sex tests where you're paying, so you pay $10 to the seed. Well, you pay $15 to go and have the plant sexed, right? And that's just not really a, an efficient use of resources. So there's a lot of benefits of using of, of using kind of process. And remember, that's a trait, right? So if you're feminizing seeds and you grow 100, and you have one male, you rope that male, you pick two more females, you feminize, feminize that, then you have a thousand and maybe one male, then you pick the best one and feminize that, and then you have a hundred thousand and only one male. So you can breed that trait out just the same as any trait, right? How do you recommend doing that to get to the guy that I wish is? The guy that you see, well, yep. typically what's used is, uh, Mark called, said it earlier, ethylene inhibitors. Uh, ethylene is the major plant hormone that controls gender in cannabis. Uh, it's the same hormone that causes a banana to ripen. You, or avocados, you know, you put it in a paper bag and you track those gases. Um, so what we do in cannabis is we use these inhibitors. One of them is a silver compound called silver thiosulfate. You can also use colloidal cool. silver. You spray it on the plant, and that blocks the ethylene receptor. And Alex when, Jones is all about colloidal silver. <laughs> <laughs> so are the Smurfs. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if you've seen that. There's, there's a there's some individual on the internet. He went and drank a bunch of colloidal silver. People think that it has this health benefit. It maybe it does in, in low amounts, but if you drink too much, you turn blue. So what? Smart. Yeah, look it up. Just go to Google and yeah. Google yeah. Google. Yeah. You know. I went to a nerdy school, so you know how in some <coughs> schools when people pass out from drinking, they get all markered up. Well, they used to spray uh, silver nitrate on people, so they turn their skin brown and they wake up and have like a black face. Yeah. I mean, sorry, no. Midwest. <laughs> Wrong time. Ryan, Too soon. Do you believe you can? Uh, sorry. Know the gender from the seed shape? How? Not, not, that's that's been a fallacy. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't. Uh, so you can't see shape like anything. It's just another morphological right. characteristic. Yeah. Um, but now at this point in time, you can you can germinate the seeds and take a DNA sample and find the, the test their DNA means. But now you can't. Or if you're Monsanto, you can use your seed chipper. And, uh, there you go. Figure that out. Right? Uh, any other questions? Well, that's it. Big round of applause for Ryan Lee. Thank you.